All right, guys, welcome. We are live for episode number 67 of the Before the Trainwreck series. I'm joined tonight uh, with Jonathan C. Noble, a family lawyer in the state. Uh, it's Pennsylvania? Pennsylvania, y yes. Yeah, uh, so he reached out to me um, a week or two back and said, um, you know, let's do stream. This is what I do. And he sent me some links to some content that he's worked on in the past. So I thought, you know, seeing as the theme of the Before the Train Wreck series is to try to help guys avoid making a train wreck out of their lives. One of the biggest ones that a lot of guys make is getting married or walking into a marriage, uh, not knowing what they're getting into because it's often a slaughterhouse. And if you're going to walk into it, you should walk into it with your eyes wide open. Um, let's let, let's start a little bit with your um, background story, how you got into family law. Um, you know, I know we were talking for, for a little bit before we went live. I know that you've went through a divorce yourself. Why did you choose to leave your business life and get into family law? And like, what did that all look like for you? Like, if you can kind of give us the origin of all that. Yeah. Background is I have an MBA and uh, a law degree and I use the MBA uh, to start a company. Uh, it was very successful for many, many years. Um, one of our uh, many customers, uh, large customers uh, was going off and doing their own thing. They were purchased by another company and uh, I was going to law school at night. Uh, my company was very successful. I didn't need to borrow money, didn't go into debt to go to law school. Um, I was married at the time uh, and uh, got a law degree, passed a bar exam, and started taking cases while I was an entrepreneur, sort of pro bono cases. Uh, and then uh, as about a year or two went by, I took child custody case, a non-complicated divorce case, uh, started to really get involved in that and got to be better known, uh, got a very good reputation in the community, got referrals from other lawyers for family law matters, and realized I had a real passion for it. So I made the switch and um, haven't looked back. You know, mm. it's been many years. I've been 20 years, you said? I do. Yeah. Yeah. So you've got um, a few talking points here that I've got on my other screen. And if you guys have questions during the stream, uh, if you're a member of the channel, you can ask them there. I'll keep my eyes open for them where you can super chat them. We can put them up on the screen. Uh, Jonathan's also offered to, if you're watching this as a recording, you can put your question down below. Uh, if it's if it's reasonable, like it's if it's within a couple of days of this recording being published and he has a chance to go back in, he's going to look for some um, intelligent questions to perhaps respond to. So um, for those of you that are live right now, let's, let's talk about prenups and the importance of them and I, actually, let me start with this because there's this um, there's this pre this preconceived notion that prenups aren't worth the paper they're written on, and they get used as toilet paper often in court, or they get thrown out. Um, and I know that's not true because I've seen a lot of guys successfully get divorced um, safely with a prenup. I did personally from my own experience here in Canada, and I've heard many many stories of guys in the U.S. So. Are, are, are prenups garbage or are they garbage in certain states? Like what's your view on them generally speaking? Yeah. Let me just preliminarily say like, this is not legal advice for anybody out there listening. It's just information, food for thought. Um, only your lawyer with whom you have an attorney client relationship with in your jurisdiction can give you legal advice. So with that being said, um, in Pennsylvania, uh, and many other States, the courts are prenup friendly. Um, there's certain rules that you have to follow in every jurisdiction in the United States, uh, and it varies widely from state to state. In Pennsylvania, um, you have to provide full and fair disclosure uh, of all your assets. That means everything. I tell my prenup clients, I want every statement, every uh, tax return, every uh, financial institution statement every credit card debt that you have, because we're going to disclose everything. We're not going to take a chance. It's silly. You have to disclose everything or else the other side doesn't know what they're giving up by signing a prenup. There's a lot of statutory requirements in most jurisdictions about executing a prenup. A prenup, it has to be notarized. Uh, there's formalities uh, that go into the signing of a prenup. There's a prenup. There's a certain amount of time that you have to give someone in order to have it reviewed uh, by counsel of their own choosing in order to try to ensure 
that it will withstand ju judicial scrutiny. Uh, you don't want to give it to somebody a couple days before the wedding or at the rehearsal dinner the night before. Uh, that will never hold up. Uh, so the best thing to do is find an experienced attorney uh, in family law and uh, who does prenups uh, and listen to them and follow their advice. That's, uh, that's number one. Where does that story come from that prenups aren't worth the paper that they're written on? I've it heard so many complaints from guys and they're, of course, probably not speaking from their own personal experience or maybe they're projecting, but a lot of guys, it's, it's like they're just garbage. Don't even waste your time. Right. Here's what, for people who think that leave a comment and give me a case site where somebody followed the statute meticulously in their jurisdiction and it got set aside. The number one thing that I see in my practice when people do their own prenups, they get set aside. The reason is they're defective. They're statutorily defective. You didn't give full disclosure of your assets and debts. Um, you didn't have it notarized properly. You gave it to the person before, uh, you know, three days before the wedding. They'll never withstand judicial scrutiny. There are other states that have rules that are more strict than Pennsylvania. Um, for example, uh, and again, this is not legal advice, but in a state where, say, uh, the Dodgers play, uh, you might uh, have to have your prenup be fair and reasonable at the time of execution, uh, and it cannot be unconscionable at the time the divorce decree is entered. Well, that's a really, that's a different rule. Uh, and your attorney in that jurisdiction would need to advise you how to set up your prenup so it can pass muster. And how would they know? Well, their experience and the relevant case law in that jurisdiction would help guide them. They want it to be fair and reasonable at the time you enter into it and not unconscionable at exit. Whereas in Pennsylvania, Prenups are viewed by the courts under contract principles. As long as there are two consenting adults uh, and no one's put under duress, and you can agree to anything. The courts love when adults agree without involving the court. They don't need the courts to tell them what's fair. If they have legal counsel and they are of sound mind and they've been given plenty of time to review it with their counsel, think about it. Uh, Pennsylvania loves prenups. There are other states, uh, New York, they have their own rules too. Every state seems to have a little tweak of their prenup statute and their appellate court decisions that interpret these prenup statutes. So uh, to say they're not worth the paper they're written on, I would go back and say, well, was it a DYI prenup? Um, why do you say that? Give me the specifics. What happened? Did somebody do it on the back of an envelope? Uh, was she drunk? Uh, did she not have a lawyer? Like, did he have a gun to her head? What's going on? Why is it thrown out? Judges like prenups that are properly done. It strips away a lot of time. We're, to get, get we're to probably going to skip up a little bit uh, here and, you know, dance around. But um, I think that generally speaking, prenups tend to get thrown out or deemed not very useful to rely on in a divorce if they've been married for like 10 years and she quit her job, uh, took care of three kids, her skills are out of date. Um, you know, like circumstances have changed dramatically. There's going to be certain scenarios where prenups, you know, like they lose their value over time is the way that I understood it. Right. Um, in some jurisdictions and just my understanding, not legal advice in Canada, the courts will look to see what's fair. So, um, they can modify it. They could throw the whole thing out. Um, if it's unconscionable in some jurisdictions, uh, the judge could say, you know, she was a stay at home wife for 25 years and you just built an empire and you're giving her a hundred thousand dollars and you're worth a hundred million. Uh, if you're in one of those jurisdictions, uh, and the law allows it, the courts could modify it to make it a little bit more fair. But other jurisdictions like a Pennsylvania, contract principles, that's the deal you made. Uh, that being said, there's plenty of times where I'll write into a prenup, 
an escalation clause or a step-up clause, where if you're together for one year, you get X amount, three years, Y amount, uh, and up 10 years, 15 years, uh, and it really balloons uh, to the point where you're not raising kids, stay at home, quitting your job, not using your skill set and building your skill set, and then you're kicked to the curb. Rarely am I asked to do something like that, and typically I'll explain to my client that that is not going to be looked upon favorably. If it's a, and we can do something to help make it a little bit more equitable uh, in the drafting. So. And as it's far not, as what, what uh, prenups can deal with, I mean, generally they're intended to deal with, well, what I brought to the table is mine and what you brought to the table is yours. And if it doesn't work out, we, you know, we keep our piles of, of gold and we kind of go our, our separate ways, but they don't deal with things like child custody arrangements. I had a friend once that said, I'm going to write in my prenup that I want a BJ at least once a week. And it's like, <laughs> you know, there's certain things that, you know, prenups aren't useful for, right? Like they mostly deal with assets. Uh, the big thing is assets, uh, the identification and division of assets and alimony and spousal support. Uh, there's been a ton of cases litigated. Uh, you know, there's one case out of California, the Howell case, where uh, it, it dealt with spousal support um, and the guy won. Uh, the, the law was changed in between the year that they signed the prenup and the year that it went into effect. Uh, the law changed and the court said, no, we're not going to... Uh, be retroactive. It's the law at the time that it was signed. So the, the prenup may not have stated that. Um, and the way the law is written, it didn't say the law is specifically retroactive. But, uh, you know, alimony, spousal support, assets, uh, child custody, I don't know, one jurisdiction where it is uh, ironclad. The courts are always going to be in a position to modify child custody in the best interest of the child. They can use it as a guideline in some jurisdictions, but typically uh, I won't put child custody in a prenup uh, because it's really not enforceable. Uh, it, it can give guidance, but it, that same thing with child support. Most jurisdictions uh, use it as guidance, but the guidelines in the jurisdiction will pretty much determine the judge has wide latitude to determine child support. It can go off the guidelines, higher or lower. Uh, um, a lot of guys are frightened to have the conversation about a prenuptial agreement if they're going to live in a way that the state deems as a marriage. So what is the best way for men to approach the conversation of Hey, babe, love you. <laughs> want to spend the rest of my life with you. Sign this piece of paper in case it doesn't work out so I can keep my stuff. Right. Um, I would say the first thing to do before you have the conversation is if you can get a basic understanding of prenup law in your jurisdiction somehow, um, either through reading the statute. These statutes are available. You no longer need uh, a lawyer or Westlaw. You can at least read the statute and try to digest it and comprehend it. Some of them are incredibly convoluted, and you may need somebody to explain it. But more to your point, um, I've never had a client come for a consultation, leave, and then bring up the discussion and have it blow up in his or her face. Uh, you're, you're not going to try and make somebody uh, live on the street. But if they're reasonable and they'll at least entertain the idea, um, that's what you want. You want to get the feedback because if they say, no way, I'm not signing anything. I don't care if you started a business and you're worth a hundred million dollars, you might really think about whether or not this person uh, is in your corner. Um, you're not saying you're leaving them with nothing, but you're making your marital commitment yours, not the state's. It's not going to default to what the state thinks is equitable. Or if you're in one of the community property states, it's not going to be by their rules. Uh, so the courts like it when adults say, okay, uh, you know, we'll make your own agreement, but follow the statute, follow the appellate court decisions. So you craft it the right way. One of the most important things, Rich, uh, and I cannot overemphasize this, is you need to have this conversation with your potential spouse before the invitations 
to any wedding are ordered. You need to have this conversation before any save the date cards are ordered. Why? Because if you read the appellate opinions in many jurisdictions, the woman many times comes back with, I felt like I had to sign the prenup because I couldn't cancel the wedding or it would be an embarrassment to me. Uh, my family made plans to fly in and uh, I felt coerced. I had to do it. Don't. And the courts most of the time say, uh, uh, that's not duress. That doesn't rise to the level of duress. The guys that win these cases have proof that they've given the other person uh, a finished version or close to finished version of a prenup before wedding plans were made, before a wedding dress was purchased, before an engagement ring was purchased, which is a whole nother story. But the earlier, the better. I've had client, potential clients call me three weeks before a, a wedding wanting a prenup and I won't take their case and explain to them, I've never gotten a prenup back from opposing counsel with no revisions. It's just almost impossible. There's always something that's in there that needs to be negotiated. And uh, I would prefer not to be up against a wedding date deadline. It's no good for anyone. So the earlier, the better. You'll get the temperature of the other side if they'll do it. And if they don't do it, you need to decide whether or not this is the person you want to marry. Is that so, a big red flag if um, you've got a substantial amount of wealth and assets and she refuses to sign a prenup? It is a big red flag um, because she doesn't if she re, if she rejects a prenup out of hand without even knowing the terms. Um, yeah, I mean, there are prenups where guys have agreed to give her over seven figures, mm -hmm. but it's limited to that. Uh, if he's worth a lot more, he has a family business that he's running and he wants to keep that separate. So that's a good segue into what you need to think about before mm -hmm. you see a lawyer. What is it that you're trying to protect? You have kids from an earlier marriage. So if you die, uh, you know, that they're not disinherited by the new wife. Do you have a family business? Uh, do you have other assets that you're bringing into the marriage that, you don't want calculated into the marital estate. Let's say you own real estate and you had all of this real estate before you got married or a business, you know, everything that happens during the marriage stays in the marriage generally. So without a prenup, all of the increase in value of that real estate over 10 years or longer, however long you're married is a marital asset, unless you have a prenup, which mm -hmm. excludes all of that uh, increase in value. So that's a good mechanism. And if somebody doesn't want to sign that after you've busted your rear end to uh, collect this real estate portfolio, you might want to ask, why not? I mean, that's not fair. Often the, um, the pushback from women seems to come from some soundbite or some narrative along the line of, uh, well, if we sign that, then we're really like, we're really not in love or we're setting the marriage up to fail if we do that. That's that's usually some version of this or that. Like, how how would you recommend a client uh, respond to something like that? It's just a pragmatic, practical thing. It will also save uh, a ton of costs and wear and tear on both of them, not to have to litigate it. But I don't buy that Disney esque. Oh, love, you're my one. We're gonna be together till death do us part. First Was marriage. That about <laughs> Pardon? It says that in the vows. Yeah, I mean, that's that's crazy. Uh, Statistically, it is, isn't it? Yeah. Would you jump out of an airplane if there was a 50% plus chance that the parachute wouldn't open? Nope. I don't think so. No, nope, but women every day convince men to get married without a prenup. Well, come on, guys. You hold that frame. Uh, you, you don't have to be a jerk about it. And you don't have to say, well, every penny I make during the course of this marriage, even if we have 10 kids, is going to be mine if you decide to leave me. But you have every right to step up and say, you know what, it makes good sense uh, for me to do this. And you, you're you not looking to give her nothing. Um, I Honestly, I've had women who are the moneyed spouse, and they stand firm. No wedding until this is done to my satisfaction. Amazing um, how that works. Huh? It, 
and these are very, very beautiful, attractive women yeah. who have worked hard and earned it. Some earned, some inherited, some, whatever. They didn't care how long it took uh, to nail the final version down and then have it properly executed. So it's, it just makes good sense. So there's thing, there's mechanisms in place that you can put in a prenup, like a sunset clause, where if you're married for a certain number of years, uh, the prenup could go away, but everything's negotiable between two adults in most jurisdictions. The courts can step in and modify it or set it aside. Um, so long story short, uh, you have to know what jurisdiction you're in, what the law says, and have it properly drafted and executed. Gotcha. I got a question here from one of the guys that preemptively uh, dropped this when I created the event the other day. Uh, and I'll just read it. It says, um, I'd like to ask, as I understand family law, it makes no difference whether or not a marriage contract is involved and you still end up in the same family court system if there's a separation where children are involved. So for men who would like to have children, is there any reason why they shouldn't sign a marriage contract in that context? By avoiding marriage, are you not missing out on the tax benefits of being married? Or are there clear advantages to navigating the court system when a marriage can't contract is never signed? He's basically asking, you know, if you live in a way that the state deems as a marriage, but you never go through the marriage ceremony, never sign the marriage contract, but you have children, family law applies to the um, custody of the children. And if you've lived long enough together where the state views it as common law, you're basically married regardless of whether or not you've signed a uh, marriage contract or had a ceremony, right? That's a great question. Um, many jurisdictions no longer recognize common law marriage. And in Pennsylvania in 2005, uh, if you started to cohabitate with someone, I think it's January 1st, 2005, no, there's no such thing as common law marriage. You have to go through the ceremony um, because it was too hard to untangle. Are they holding themselves out as a married couple? Uh, do they consider themselves husband and wife? Do they share finances? Uh, so in jurisdictions like Pennsylvania, there's no more common law marriage. So you'd have to know what the law is. Conversely, um, it's my understanding, and you'd need to check with someone in British Columbia, Canada, uh, you're with someone for a couple of years, there's uh, laws that may attach or other provinces uh, after a certain amount of time cohabitating with someone where certain laws attach to that union. Uh, so it's all very specific to the pro province law, provincial law, or state law where you're domiciled. Mm -hmm. uh, no easy answer. Um, now, to answer the other part of his question, it is generally the state same family law system. Child custody cases are heard along with divorce cases uh, in, in the same jurisdiction by the same judges. Uh, so I'm not sure if I answered directly, but uh, it sounds to me like he's in a common law jurisdiction. So I would advise him to seek counsel in that jurisdiction so he can better understand what he's getting himself into. It's not a good idea for all guys to buy an hour or two of a lawyer's time before they get married. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, um, you know, that's one of the reasons I really appreciate you not putting this behind a paywall because sometimes you guys just need to hear it, uh, for food for thought. Um, I, and I'm not looking for people to come to me, but go to a local experienced family law attorney in your jurisdiction and they will be able to explain how the law works, what your rights and responsibilities are as you enter the marriage, if you exit a non-functioning marriage, what your rights and responsibilities are uh, regarding child support, child custody, um, how to best protect yourself and what the pitfalls are, how to avoid that minefield in front of you. Um, that and being red-pilled are a pretty good combination of how to avoid horrific catastrophic life-changing events. So where did you come across the uh, notion of being red pilled? Like where did you first hear about that? Well, I didn't know there was a name for it, uh, but I knew that what I did for a living, um, I'm thinking to myself, I can't be the only one uh, since I'm a divorce lawyer and divorce court, other guys need to know that. Um, and then either your channel or one of the other guys channels came on my YouTube, uh, screen on, on the uh, playlist 
And that opened a rabbit hole to a whole area, a whole community of people who are engaging with trying to learn from, uh, trying to understand how the system works uh, and female nature. And thank God for technology, because before this was available through the Internet, guys just had word of mouth. Or right, heard their uncle. Life. This is saving lives. There's not a lot of guys that had access to this prior to 2009 before YouTube got, got real popular. Right. Um, high risk, low reward. Is the juice worth the squeeze? I guess he's asking, generally speaking, because broadly speaking, it's high risk for men and lower reward. Uh, and conversely, it's uh, opposite for women where it's uh, lower risk and higher reward because women tend to marry up and it's not often that women will settle for a guy that's uh, lower on the socioeconomic scale because of hypergamy. I think that you're probably familiar with that term. Yeah. Um, but like broadly speaking, it, it, is, it, is it still a high risk, low reward environment for men when it comes to marriage because women tend to marry up to richer guys? Um, that's a broad question. Uh, the simple answer is there's risk. There's definitely risk. If you're ambitious um, and you are focused and you are doing all the right things, there's no guarantee that she's not going to leave uh, for a better deal um, or no reason at all with no fault divorce. You don't even need a reason. Um, you could just say, I'm not happy anymore. And you, unless you have a valid prenup, you're at the mercy of the family laws in your jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. So, uh, who the question is a good one there's risk uh no question about it um is there any benefit to a guy i mean a lot of guys are hell-bent on getting married it's just like i it's, it's part of my culture it's part of my religion i want to have children okay fine i'm vehemently opposed to it i will still remain vehemently opposed to it till the day that i die um but are there states where guys might plan to move to that are more friendly to fathers in the event that the knot needs to be untied or certain states they may want to stay away from if they're thinking about getting married like is that is that worth considering well wow, that's a that's not a great reason to relocate because it's hard to unplant yourself but if you're thinking about having children why don't you look at the child custody laws and see how the cases are decided judges pull their hair out to try to get it right. And they really try to follow the law. So you take a state like Pennsylvania, it's gender blind. Okay. They're not allowed to use gender. There used to be what was known here in Pennsylvania as a tender years doctrine where little kids went with the mother. No longer. How long you ago know? did they change that? Uh, 2011. Uh, there was wow, a new child. Recent. Yeah. Fairly recent. Wow. Uh, but depending on now it used to be, what they did was they codified um, what the courts, the 16 different factors that the courts must examine whenever they hear a child custody case. And um, so when I have a child custody client, I explain what the law is and what the courts are going to look at. But if someone wants to move to a jurisdiction, that's still no guarantee that they're going to get equally shared uh, custody time. I can tell you, though, that uh, in courts that I've been in, the courts really believe, and so do I, that it's the kids are so much better off if they have two parents in their lives and not one parent being like every Wednesday night and every other weekend and stuff. You know, they're active. But in order to do that, you kind of have to be in the same school district. The courts aren't going to generally make a kid travel a couple hours every other day in the car, especially if they're small and, you know, you if the kid is small, you know, they want to do what's in the best interest of the child. So if the parents live in the same school district or close um, and they can get the public school transportation to pick the kid up at mom's house or dad's house, they'll try to go as close to half and half as they can in most uh, jurisdictions where I practice, which is generally Pennsylvania. Uh, so you have to look at how the courts make these custody decisions. And that information is out there. You just have to want to look for it and get it. It's all available. That's um, not a guarantee. Where would uh, people go looking for that if they wanted to dig it up? Like where's the best place or, this, or the keywords that they should use to do some research there? Yeah, like I would say uh, you could start with child custody law in, in whatever state you're in. Um, and then 
uh, all states usually have online statutes that you can access uh, for free. You just need uh, to just Google in, you know, custody law, child custody law mm -hmm. in this jurisdiction, and you could see how the courts decide these custody cases. Can you read uh, case law? Like in the U.S., is there a website where you can read case law between couples that are that are battling it out? Uh, well, the case law that you read is the appellate court opinions that have, oh, okay. uh, so to answer your question, some jurisdictions do, uh, publish their appellate court decisions, both the highest level court, which is sometimes a Supreme court and the superior court, which is the intermediate appellate court where a lot of these cases are decided, but, um, you don't need a subscription in many States, um, Pennsylvania Superior Court has a website. They publish the opinions every day. Um, I think California, you can look at published opinions through a website uh, that's free. Uh, the problem is if you're not trained in the law, uh, there's a lot of uh, verbiage and terminology that you're not going to understand. Uh, there's also the way that the judges write the opinions to try to establish precedent. Um, and without going into too much detail, there's published opinions that lawyers are allowed to use in many jurisdictions to support their position and unpublished, which don't have a lot of uh, value, precedential value in most jurisdictions. So you have to know if you're looking at a published opinion and how to determine that and what the court is deciding. So it's, so it's not the court transcripts because I've read case law here where it's court transcripts and they're like 160 pages long. Like I spent a lot of time reading case law when I was getting divorced on um, disputes that were similar to the scenario that I was going to be entering into and transcripts. It's like line by line by line. So you can't get that there? No, unless okay. you're a counsel for one of the parties, that kind of stuff uh, become public because it's too personal. Yeah. Um, and that, you know, people public should record have here. So if you're in Canada, you can go and find it on canlee.org, C A N L I I.org. Okay. Uh, I'm going to check that out. Uh, but here, no, you need to, it, it, it's like airing people's dirty laundry. There's a lot of personal stuff that goes on. Um, just one other thing I wanted to mention about, um, prenups and divorce and, uh, in, in the U S if a woman wants to prepare to leave her husband, there are organizations that give seminars on how to do it the right way. Right? Uh, uh, and I don't see too many for men. So if you Google women uh, seminar on divorce, you know, you might see like uh, different organizations that give like free advice. Uh, the guy should probably get educated too and, and level that playing field. I don't mm -hmm. see a lot of men's groups doing that. And uh, that no, you don't want to give somebody a head start. You want the head start. Yeah. Uh, hopefully you don't get divorced. But if you can't fix these problems, uh, nobody should stay miserable forever. I, I've um, often said that um, family law generally, uh, I mean, it encourages women to behave badly so they can optimize their hypergamy on the exit to 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 maximize the benefit, which which usually results in them pushing to be the custodial caregiver to the children, like being the uh, primary parent, um, which means they'll have more time, which means money will mostly flow to her and she'll make unilateral decisions on what to do with the kids, where to live, school, medical procedures, so on and so forth. Um, what's your view on that component of family law and the way that it, I mean, the intent is for it to be in the best interest of the kids, but the way that it comes off, the way that in practice it seems to work is women tend to leverage it in such a way that um, it it becomes so hostile for men. It's almost like they often act in an underhanded way. Like you'll see them make these false domestic violence allegations against their husbands. Um, you know, it's not uncommon to have these happen so they can, you know, sway the pendulum in their favor. What are your thoughts on that part of it? Um, most judges are hip to that stuff. Um, they hate parental alienation. Um, now that being said, uh, some judges, and it can really come down to the judge, uh, you know, they follow the law. Some judges like subtly start at 50, 50. You got to like convince the judge, uh, female judges and male judges. You got to tell me why, if you're living in the same school district, there isn't a week on week off situation. As long as both mom and dad can be home or make a provision to 
have some responsible adult home. So when the kid walks in from school, he's not a latchkey kid. He gets a hot meal. Um, number one concern in my experience is the safety of the child. If there's any question about that, uh, usually that is weighed very heavily. Uh, so once safety is taken care of, and that's not an issue, um, you know, a lot of judges are hip to mom, you know, it can backfire on someone who makes a false uh, domestic violence allegation. Uh, and it's not, you know, there's no restraining order granted at a hearing. Uh, it makes her look like she's scheming and they can lose credibility. How uh, often do they successfully like peel back the layer to reveal the truth behind the false domestic allegations? Because whenever I've talked to police officers about them getting calls on that, like the default that they've like, they've been told you just take him away. He's automatically to blame, you know, regardless of what happened and just throw him in a slammer overnight and you'll deal with it, you know, tomorrow, but you have to remove him from the household if she's scared sort of thing. And it's not like you even have an opportunity as a guy to have a conversation with law enforcement or even offer an opinion. Like there's a lot of, um, you know, there's a lot of videos that I've seen now that guys have sent to me where it's like women have prepared uh, for their false DV ch uh, charge by running into a wall or, or punching themselves in the face, you know, bef like moments before their husband gets home and she's on a phone. It's like he walks in the door. It's like, yes, yes, I'm very scared. He just hit me. And he's like, what's going on? Right. Right. Um, this doesn't happen every day, obviously, but this is just one example that has come across my plate a couple of times. Right. I mean, that's a problem. Uh, f false uh, domestic violence uh, allegations. Domestic violence is a real problem. Let's let's uh, face that. But uh, people who stage being hurt or run into a wall to try to give themselves a black eye um, and then file a protection from abuse uh, petition and try to get the guy out that way. Um, if they're caught, they should be prosecuted. There is, they're, they're uh, lying under oath, uh, but it's they're rarely prosecuted. The case just gets dismissed. In some jurisdictions, including Pennsylvania, uh, there has to be a hearing within a certain amount of time after an initial hearing takes place. The initial hearing is an ex parte hearing, which means only you, the, the person making the claim and the judge, there's, the other side doesn't have a chance. And I think that that's done because they wanna protect somebody and they'll err on the side of maybe not getting it right right away, but within 10 days, there's a final hearing and both sides are uh, able to put, up the, put on their case. But to answer your question, I think there was a case where Amber Heard and uh, it's one Depp, of them, yeah. It's yeah, yeah, he recorded her. So I tell guys, if you're living separate and apart under the same roof, because a lot of people can't afford to move out and you're about to file for divorce, you're not sleeping together, but she has a propensity or you think there's even a chance, everybody that has a cell phone has a video recorder. So just pull it out and make sure that you've got evidence that what she's trying to do is wrong. And um, that would that's one line of defense. Um, you know, the courts try so hard to get these right, um, but sometimes people are good liars and they're actresses. And, you know, you don't wanna, you wanna get away from that situation. Um, and even if you vet people, they can turn into that. So that video recorder can go a long way. I've used it uh, to defend my clients against bald allegations. Yeah, um, there's a comment here from Abram. He says, my ex-wife said that I threatened the family with a gun. Little did she know that I'd taken the gun out of the house two weeks prior. She got caught in a lie and a false report helped me get full legal and physical custody of my daughter. Beautiful. Um, you yeah. should definitely remove your firearms from your house. You know, if you have a gun safe, just bring it over to your brother's house or just, just get out of the way because it, it just gives her something to point and sputter at that could potentially cause problems for you later if you're still living under the same roof. Yeah, under, in Pennsylvania and other jurisdictions, you have to w relinquish any firearms if you have any to law enforcement if somebody files a petition for, of domestic abuse, yeah. you know, but, uh, you know, as one area that is very difficult to navigate, they just err on the side of caution mm -hmm. and it, it can backfire, though, as uh, mm -hmm. the last uh, person who left a message said. There's there's some places where you can't legally record somebody. Um, uh, it, it's my view, and I want to hear what you have to say on this, but it's my view that even if it's not legal to record them to use it in the divorce hearing or any kind of custody arrangement, you can at least get some intel as far as what her intentions are. Um, yeah. 
you know, to kind of plan your own strategy or, or perhaps pivot if you need to, if you've heard something that you didn't, you know, uh, think about in the past, like, is this something that you talk to your clients about or? Yeah, I tell them not to violate the law. You can't report somebody <laughs> in a lot of jurisdictions without their knowledge. Yeah. Now, if somebody leaves you a voicemail, they are put on notice that they're being recorded. So we've used voicemails before in my cases okay. where someone will just go off the deep end for no reason and show just how crazy they are. Uh, and they knew that they were leaving a voicemail. So that's not recording them. But uh, you don't want to violate any laws around recording someone. Uh, you know, that is all out of bounds. Don't do it. Uh, now, if they consent to being recorded or they know they're being recorded, uh, you know, you're video th videotaping them in front of them. And uh, yeah, but you don't want to do anything in that gray area. You don't want to have them break the law. Okay. Um, you've got a few talking points here for vetting and deciding to marriage slash cohabitate. Um, do you want to go through a few of these? I want to make sure that we get some of these talking points here that you've got listed out because some of them are, are quite um, good. Well, let me ask you this question because because the one that stood out on the sheet was um, on the last page, number eight. It says, "Could the MGTOW movement help change family slash divorce laws?" What's your view on that? Because a lot of these guys think if you just uncheck from the sexual marketplace, if enough you know, if enough guys say no and we all go our own way, women will change, divorce laws will change. What's your view on that? I think that the MGTOW movement has uh credibility but guys should know that divorce laws and prenup laws are changing um through appellate case law uh, i know california modified their prenup law as of january 1st 2020 they tweaked it a little bit um so i think most people have never read a prenup statute or divorce code statute and they ought to educate themselves they also edit might think about educating themselves around how laws change. You know, um, the state legislatures generally make the laws, you know, the statutes. And if you think that there's something that needs to get changed, that's reasonable, you ought to bring it up to the right people that can help effectuate that change. Uh, I could tell you in Pennsylvania in 2016, uh, if you wanted to divorce someone who didn't want to be divorced from you and wanted to drag it out and just raise frivolous issues to cause more pain and angst, it would take, there was a two year waiting period up until 2016. And some of the smartest lawyers in Pennsylvania, family law attorneys, uh, went to the state legislature and got a bill passed where the waiting time for a divorce that was contested uh, was shrunk down to one year to let guys get on with their lives. So they didn't have to wait two years anymore. That was just gut wrenching. So their change is afoot, but you have to know where to go and you have to have a clear idea of what changes you're looking for. Um, so personally, unless there's some protection and there's some special reason, why get married? Um, if no one got married, I'd find some other area of the law to practice in love. Uh, there'd be no divorces. Uh, the, the court, people are treated unfairly and the folks who are, uh, clamoring about it, they have every right to, uh, in my opinion. Uh, the other side of the coin is somebody, mar you marry somebody, uh, and they raise uh, a few kids and drop out of the workforce. And then you run off with your secretary. They need to be treated fairly too. But I definitely hear the guys that are saying, you know, I put my heart and soul into this. And one day she just said, you're not giving me the tingles anymore. I'm going somewhere else or I'm monkey branching to someone else where they just go off. And, you know, the laws, they don't care. You know, Why do you think women file more divorces uh, than men. I think the stats are something like seven or eight out of 10 divorces are initiated by women. Yeah, I mean, you you could comb through all the docket sheets and see that the plaintiff or petitioner is female or has a female name. But sometimes people agree to get divorced uh, 
and they'll just put one or the other name as the petitioner. Like they already have a marital settlement agreement. So that number could be a little bit skewed or not as accurate just because the woman's name is, is petitioner. But in a contested divorce, and sometimes you don't really know whether the divorce is contested or not. Uh, you can look at a docket or a lawyer could look at a docket and say, you know, this divorce decree got entered in 91 days, so it probably wasn't contested. Um, and her name is first, but that doesn't matter. But in contested divorces, um, you know, I, I don't know what the exact number is. I have plenty of guys who, um, you know, they should have divorced 10 years ago, but they just stuck it out in a loveless marriage. And women too, you know, women too. And then somebody pulls a trigger and files it. Or uh, they, their uh, spouse is passive aggressive and there is no intimacy. The marriage has been dead for years and they just can't take it anymore, um, both men and women. So I don't know if uh, that statistic is, is accurate, uh, but just as a, a general rule of thumb, uh, it looks to be maybe a little skewed. My practice right now is about half and half, uh, men and women who are going to file. Uh, Have you ever so, fired a client for misbehaving or acting in such a way you didn't want to represent them? Yeah. Uh, my retainer agreement is very thorough. And, uh, if you're going to hire me, you got to listen to me. And if you're not listening to me, uh, I don't want you anymore. Uh, be, because you're not going to get the res the best result possible under the law. If you'd want to do that, go hire someone else for less money. Uh, but if you want to listen uh, and you want to return my phone call on Saturday night because I have something I'm working on, uh, I'm your guy. You know. But if you're not going to listen, let's go our separate ways uh, because I'm going to do everything I can do. I need you to do everything you can do to get the best possible result. So the answer is yeah. Uh you gave me this uh, DUI cartoon you wanted to talk about. Let me put it up on the screen here so you can reference it. Actually, I sent you also uh, why a prenup uh, cartoon, uh, which is which is this one. Um, I, I don't have why okay. a prenup. Is that the one yeah. drink? No. Okay, so I've got the one with the drink two for one liquor DUI. Oh. Okay, I use that cartoon. Um, when my daughter was in high school, I used to uh, have uh, her friends over like on a Friday night, be in a kitchen. I hold court and explain to the girls, uh, do not drink and drive uh, for a number of reasons. Um, so if that was uh, I, I made a, a different version of it, uh, you really need to know what you're getting yourself into. Now, in the DUI cartoon, that's drink two for one. And there's like a trap there where a guys unsuspecting on the road. Um, and he gets, goes into a bar and then he pulling out of the bar. A lot of times you'll get arrested for DUI or pulled over, but the people who win, um, are the, uh, the lawyer, uh, the police department, the local hold government, yours up if you want. You know, the updated one. I'm sorry. Hold up yours with your own version. If you want to show them what, that one there. Yeah. All right. So it says why a prenup and you could see a guy he's driving in. Uh, to a wedding cake and it says marriage and love and bliss and unlimited sex and um, no stress, great world travel, love. Respect, uh, compassion. Yeah. yeah. Happy forever. Um, but if you marry the wrong person uh, who is right here, uh, who the wrong, I, as I put as the wrong spouse, they're going to pull this out. And you're going to get stuck. And who's going to win? The therapist or the child therapist if there's kids. The lawyers. The local government makes money. Uh, the appraiser for the real estate. The mediator. The arbitrator. Who's the fox? And on the end is a forensic accountant. So many divorce cases, um, you better be sure that you've done everything you can uh, to vet the, and protect yourself. Uh, I can't overemphasize that guys just, they're not thinking. They're not thinking with their brain. And uh, if you're led down the aisle by a bull ring without trying to protect yourself, protecting yourself, or vetting properly, um, you're going to end up in my office, and it's not going to be good. Uh, 
you'll, you're not going to be the best version of yourself as quickly or sustain it if there's so much stress and cortisol in your body. Uh, you don't want that. All that energy could be put towards other things, other endeavors. Uh, so you could take what I'm saying and uh, toss it, but I've seen people just destroyed by this process. I'd like to try to prevent that. Got a super chat here from uh, PN says, uh, what if the woman refuses, hates the idea of a prenup? Will a well-written prenup actually protect you in today's legal market? We kind of already dealt with that, but let's just breeze over it again for him. Sure. Um, well, somebody could hate something and still agree to sign it. So that's where you want to take care of this before the wedding invitations are printed or ordered. Because I've seen so many times, and the case law supports this, this will drag on. It will drag on. And the wedding's coming up. And we're ordering flowers. And people are coming in from out of town. Um, no, no, you don't want to do that. The other thing is, it's okay that she hates it. If she's in your frame and she wants to marry you and you're a high-value guy, I would expect that she might not like it. But that's not your problem. Uh, if you're going to acquiesce to someone not liking it or hating it because you're protecting yourself, too bad, too darn bad. You got to you, you got to have that abundance mentality. That sorry, she hates it. What's your alternative? That you acquiesce, do away with the prenup, and then find out on the back end that you're at the mercy of uh, you know state law. You, you don't want to do that. Is there any value in a post? Do you ever use those? Yeah, I've used them. And uh, most states uh, like them. They can be used. They have to be executed, at least in Pennsylvania, with the same uh, with the same rules as a prenup. It's just after the wedding. So they're definitely worthwhile, uh, but uh, they have to be executed just as formally as a prenup. The, a little bit of a problem with a postnup is you have all the leverage before the wedding. So after the wedding, uh, you lose a lot of leverage uh, mm -hmm. if you want to have a postnup. But there's good reasons to have a postnup. Uh, your circumstances might change, or you might get a big inheritance or expect one. Uh, and you want to make sure that that's kept separately and that it's acknowledged that you have it. And you don't want that to be a bone of contention or a piece of litigation if you divorce. So it might be a good idea to enter it. Or if the person won't enter into a postnup and you're getting a large inheritance, you could find a way to protect it uh, before it's bequeathed to you. Uh, so, so you, you want to plan a little bit. So a postnup for those that don't know what it is, it's, it's really just firming up what you agreed upon before you said, I do. Then you do your I do's and you kind of firm it up again. Maybe there's some slight changes if you need to, if there's been some circumstances that have, that have changed. Um, I've heard people say that you need to update um, prenups as time goes on and circumstances evolve and change. Let's say that um, you know, you've know you got a net worth of $5 million. You're a high paid executive, an entrepreneur, whatever. You make a few hundred grand a year. You've married a hairdresser that was making thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 a year. She doesn't have much to bring to the table. You sign a prenup with her. You have a couple of kids with her and then you decide, okay, five or six years has passed. She's gone back kind of part-time to do hair, but she's been raising the kids for the most part. I still want to protect my assets. Is it is it reasonable to expect that that she would sign an updated uh, prenup to bring everything up to date because five, seven years have passed? Like, What's your view on that? Uh, it depends upon what jurisdiction you're in. So if you're in a jurisdiction like Pennsylvania that uses contract principles, there's no reason to. Um, the, the lead case in Pennsylvania, a guy was, uh, exiting a, uh, residency, I think ophthalmology or orthopedic surgery. So you go from making like $30,000 a year as a resident to making millions. Uh, and the courts, uh, said contract principles, sorry, honey, uh, you lose. Uh, you knew he was a resident. You knew what his specialization was, uh, no need take another jurisdiction where it cannot be unconscionable at the time the divorce decree is entered. Well, now you're going to have to deal with the judge uh, or the courts might say, this is unconscionable. You know, she's cutting hair and making uh, 40, 50,000 and you are, uh, you know, making four or 5 million. 
No, the court could modify it. So you have to know what jurisdiction you're in. It can never hurt to update it, but you want to make sure you don't get tripped up by not doing it with the same formality that you did the original prenup with. You don't want to cut any corners. You want to have her have her own lawyer uh, because then it could look like you're trying to hide something or, yeah, if she says no, what are you going to do? You don't, you don't want to divorce her. Yeah, you can't do much once you've already been married, right? Yeah. So I'm not aware of a jurisdiction that demands an mm -hmm. update uh, to a prenup because you kind of want to do it once the right way. But if you're in a jurisdiction where the court could deem that it's unconscionable, uh, it might be something to talk to a lawyer about because you don't want to get a hamstrung on the back end of this either. So... Uh, Tuscan says, excellent production, extremely informative. Thanks, brother. And we got another Thank super you. chat here. Steve, he says, can you touch on the Dr. Dre case? He had a prenup and a postnup, but she apparently outlasted them. Are they invalid? Um, he's in California, I believe. And I would imagine it's because they were married for a longer period of time. And I think, what is it in California? After 10 years, you get alimony regardless? Uh, you know, I'm not sure of the California alimony law, but a lot of jurisdictions have changed it. I'm fascinated by that case for a number of reasons. Um, Nicole, I believe is an attorney. I'm not sure if she's a member of the bar. Um, but there's a lot of different stories that are coming out and I guess we'll know the truth when it's in. The best thing that could happen, uh, to that jurisdiction, in my opinion, it's just my opinion is, uh, she tries to set aside the prenup and the trial court, uh, upholds the prenup and she files an appeal and the appellate court in that jurisdiction files a published opinion upholding the prenup again. Um, allegedly, so somebody may have thrown it in a fireplace. That doesn't matter. Uh, in order to modify a prenup, depending upon how it's drafted, I'm assuming somebody like him has got skilled lawyers to draft a prenup. Even 24 years ago, he could afford to have the right attorneys do it. But uh, it seems to me uh, that he has a prenup. The question is, does he want to litigate it? What's the cost of settling it versus the cost of litigating it? And what's the risk? So I'm sure his lawyers are telling him, but if he went the distance and won, and one again on appeal through a published opinion, it would set a, a phenomenal precedent in that jurisdiction that prenups are going to be upheld. So we'll see what happens. Got another super chat here from Digi Nomad. He says, how do you vet for wife and kids when two out of three and poorly? How, uh, okay, so the, just so I understand the question, how do you vet for a wife? Yeah, the biggest question is, is how do you make sure you don't get screwed when two out of three times it's not going to work out? Yeah, well, let me give you a couple of bright red flags that Rich may or may not have included in his upcoming book. Um, I, I went down the rabbit hole on narcissism. So I cannot overemphasize the importance of being able to detect somebody that's either a covert or a malignant, uh, malignant narcissist. What are somebody, some good signs? Yeah, I what mean obvious signs that you would tell they really only care they really only care about themselves they have an agenda um you uh they're outward sometimes they're outwardly grandiose about themselves and their accomplishments and they're overly competitive with you and others um it's in the chapter yeah okay good good <laughs> one one other thing uh is anybody that uses intimacy as a weapon or a reward you want to, you don't want to tangle with that because that's not going to change. It is clearly unfair. That's not a great foundation. So yeah. and I'll just uh, want to, and I just want to add to that because women only use intimacy as a weapon or as a bargaining chip if she views you as a beta. So if she's doing that, she doesn't have a lot of respect for you and she doesn't have genuine burning desire for you. Cause if a woman's marrying a guy and she's head over heels and she's got one itis for him, for example, uh, she'll never decline any approaches for intimacy. She's, she's always ready to go. Women only right. decline it or use it as a manipulative tool if they're not totally into you. Right. Yeah. Okay. So there, there's another one, one other good one that, uh, I would ask guys to look for if she's a different person in private than she is in public. If she's point. just nasty 
when you guys are alone or she's moody all the time or she doesn't treat you in a loving way or she doesn't fight fairly, but in public, you know, she's, uh, you know, Tinkerbell, that's, that's a red flag. That's a really bad one. Um, so, um, also if, if you're with someone who pressures you to be somebody that you're not, mm. you know, or tries to pull you away from your pursuits and your, the things that bring you joy, uh, that's a red flag. That's not going to end well. Uh, so. What about the um, what about the strategy that a lot of guys like to use? Uh, either like, well, Western women are garbage. Just go to Asia or go to Latin America and bring one back. What often happens then? Because I mean, you must have seen this unfold at least a few times in your practice in the last twenty years. Some guy that brought a foreign bride home. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, I would advise, in the strongest possible terms, to not only have a prenup with that person. But it's imperative that you hire a court-appointed uh, or a court-approved interpreter, if English is not their first language, to interpret in their native language the entire prenup with her lawyer. Because I can't tell you how many times someone will come from South America or another uh, country in Europe where English isn't their first language. The first thing she'll say is, I didn't understand this, but she had a lawyer, but they didn't have an interpreter. So I think there's good and bad in every culture. Uh, but if you're going to bring someone into this country where hypergamy is everywhere and all she needs to do is uh, connect with women in a social setting who are divorced or bitter or, you know, just learn about how life is in this culture, you want to have a prenup and you want, you must have an interpreter because you're going to get a hamstrung uh, if she can convince a judge that she really didn't understand that she wasn't getting any spousal support. But if she so, has an interpreter, it's another layer of protection. So foreign women are no different than domestic women. I mean, they're all women. Uh, money does strange things to people. And um, if you get into a he said, she said, uh, you don't want to find yourself there. You want to protect yourself to the greatest degree possible. That's not to say that there's bad people and there's no good people, but you could vet your heart out and beyond your control, uh, you could find yourself on the wrong end of a divorce complaint, even if you have a prenup. So you want to do everything possible to make it as tight as possible. Uh, no loose ends. Nothing's 100% ironclad, but you can get it close. Um. Are there any benefits to men today to get married? Because there used to be, uh, like there's this longstanding view, especially more in the MGTOW community where men were once the head of the household and now they've been removed as the head of the household and now the state and women become the head of the household, especially with family law. So they say that men have, uh, men used to have authority with responsibility. Now men have responsibility, but with no authority anymore. Is there, is there anything in marriage for men today? Uh, that's a broad question and a great question. Uh, through my lens, um, depending upon where you are at what stage of life, if you're already made bank, you're successful, you have pursuits, um, no. Last time I looked, women like uh, intimacy and sex just as much as men do. Uh, I wish guys would realize that. Uh, but if you're taking care of yourself, who needs the stress? I mean, it can be very stressful through no fault of your own. Uh, so that's just my personal opinion. There are other cultures that think it's imperative and have arranged marriages and think it's the most important thing in the world and want offspring, uh, you know, to perpetuate their legacy or their name. But depending upon what stage of life you are in, why? Like, what's the benefit, really? So, do you see, do you see things changing for the better over the next twenty years? Do you see them getting worse? Like, what's the general direction of family law and the state of marriage in the U.S.? I think things are slowly getting better, but you got to be smart too. You got to go in with your eyes wide open. You need to know what you're getting yourself into. If there is a tinge, an inkling of bad behavior uh, that uh, 
rears its ugly head. Uh, you need to really think about if this is the right person for you. Get off of the one-itis thing, too. I mean, that's what causes a lot of guys to make bad decisions. Um, so with that, if you're doing all the right things to become the best version of yourself, you have the right mindset, you're going to get somebody who's going to mesh with that. That's, that, you know, just through my divorce lawyer lens, that's probably the best formula. But uh, for guys who are saying, I'm not going to get married until the laws are changing, if you look on any state government website, they'll show you all the bills that are being proposed in the state legislature. There's a lot of family law bills. So not in every state, but, you know, as recently as January 1st, 2020, uh, in California, for example, you know, they tweak the prenup law and what needs to be done if you're waiving something. Um, but if guys aren't going to follow the statute, doesn't matter. Uh, that's where your lawyer comes in and helps you understand this is why the prenup has to have all these recitals in it and why you have to give me all the documents so someone can't say, I didn't know or nobody yeah. told me. Uh, you don't want that. Uh, let's let's grab these other super chats here. Aunt G says, uh, do you guys get prenup when they don't get married but want to cover common law marriages or cohabitation for certain length of time? So a cohab agreement. Yeah, I think in other jurisdictions outside of Pennsylvania where there is no common law marriage anymore, you know, the Canadian provinces come to mind and other states that do recognize uh, common law marriage, absolutely, because it'll set out your rights and responsibility. Here's a problem that I could see in a cohabitation situation. Uh, and again, there's no common law marriage, but even cohabitating, what if she moves into your house and she helps you pay the mortgage for five years? And then you guys break up, but you know, the law is not going to think she doesn't have any equity or she does major improvements. That's not fair to her either. So if you have a cohabitation agreement that spells out uh, the financial responsibilities, you're going to need it. You know, you don't want to litigate anything if you don't have to. And if that can uh, help circumvent litigation. Yeah. Uh, so you got to be careful about where you are, what's going on, what the, what the laws say about your union. And uh, if there's common law after, let's say, two or three years of living together continuously in your jurisdiction, you should have a written agreement. Uh, it'll stop a lot of fighting and problems. I got another uh, super chat here from uh, Sam Whiskey, and he says, what's your professional opinion on DNA tests regarding children? So paternity, I mean, paternity is a big one for men because uh, really the whole point of um, getting married for guys would be to assure paternity to make sure the children are his because women always know that it's theirs, obviously. But right. um, somewhere, I mean, they don't have clear data on what on paternity fraud, but from what I've gathered over the years, it's it's anywhere on the low end as low as 10% and on the high end as high as 30%. Um, again, you're not going to get accurate data, but that's the spread that I've come across. What's your view on the need for a DNA test if you have children with women and how useful are they? Is there a way to you know go about that? Yeah. I if there is 0.0001% chance that that is not your child, it's easy and in many jurisdictions free to have somebody swab the inside of your cheek and do a DNA test. Because for a lot of guys who aren't sure or their woman could be promiscuous, um, once you establish yourself as that child's father and start paying child support, it's going to be extraordinarily difficult to stop uh, because the child recognizes you as the father, especially if you're not married and she slept with another guy, but puts your name on the birth certificate. If you don't think you're the dad up front right away, without delay, you need to take a stand. If you're not sure uh, again, many jurisdictions, there's not even a charge. Especially so don't wait five or six years. It's as soon as you're suspicious, it's like, it's like within no. the first few months. No, because it's impossible. You could end up owing arrearages. It's in child support. It's not even your kid. Uh, and she lied. So if there's any doubt, get it done. Why so, wouldn't you? So if you're married, you have a child, let's say the first year, you know, within the marriage, but you suspect there's foul play. She slept with Chad from, 
you know, uh, her office or maybe Kevin from sales, let's say, um, and then you discover it's true. Like, what are your, like, what's your recourse as a guy if you found out that your wife and the child you thought was yours is not in fact yours? Like, what can guys do with that? It depends upon the jurisdiction again, but, uh, the biological dad could, uh, request that the court give him visitation or even partial custody. Um, so that's why you don't want to wait. Uh, to find out it could probably it's a huge problem if she's having someone else's child but if you don't care um, you can't imagine the scenarios that play out uh, but once that child recognizes you as the father uh, and you treat the child as your child you know there's a connection there you know the course Long on the harder it is to untie that knot too right absolutely absolutely i mean uh, a lot of guys that have been on the hook to pay child support for children that aren't even theirs because they married a single mother and they acted in such a way the state viewed as a father for five or six or seven years they're on the hook for child support for the rest of the kid's life depending upon the jurisdiction the jurisdiction yeah. you got to look at the statutes but it's quite possible and what happens if after five or six years you act in loco parentis, which is the Latin term in the place of the parent, uh, you pay child support, you support them. What if she breaks up with you and takes the kid with her? Uh, you know, the, it's a it's a terrible entanglement that uh, has to get sorted out by the courts because you have some parental rights. The kid recognizes you as a father. You've been supporting them, but you're not the father. Bad things could happen. So assert your rights early and do it the right way. Uh, Godspeed says, will marriage be seen as business deal in court? I think he's asking is our marriage transactions generally handled as a business deal? I mean, it seems like a business transaction nowadays. It doesn't seem to be about love anymore. In fact, have you read uh, Stephanie Kuntz's book about marriage? No. The history of, of, it's a great book. I'd actually recommend you read it, you know, given what you do for a living, but it's, but the author is uh, Stephanie Kuntz, K-O-O-N-T-Z. And I, and I believe the book's title is a history of marriage, but marriage has never been about love. It's actually been about the acquisition of in-laws. Um, so it was more or less a business transaction for, you know, throughout history for the last 10,000 years anyway, since we created agriculture and all that. But um, today, like, is it a, is it a business transaction through the court system? Is that how it's generally viewed? Like, What's your opinion yeah. on that? Yeah, I agree that marriage over the years has been like, I'll marry you, our families will have more land, more livestock kind of thing. But the courts uh, really are very cut and dry. They don't get involved with who did what to who. Uh, they want to know if there's a divorce, is there a valid prenup? If not, here are the rules. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're going to go through the rules. We're going to go through the statute. I'm going to weigh credibility to see who's telling me the truth. I'm going to look at the evidence, all of it. I'm going to weigh the evidence, which is in the province of the uh, the trial judge to determine who, how much uh, weight do I give each piece of evidence. And then they make a ruling if you can't settle it. So, yeah, it's a business. Mm -hmm. Pennsylvania, everything's done under contract principles with a prenup. So it's a business transaction. Yes, that's how it's viewed. There you go, guys. Um, this gentleman says, found out about custody relocation laws, broke up with my girlfriend 10 minutes ago. I don't want a guy controlling where I live. What are your thoughts on that? I'm not sure what he means. I'm guessing he has a kid. So found out about custody relocation laws, broke up with my girlfriend 10 minutes ago. He doesn't want her new guy controlling where he lives. What are your thoughts on that? My thoughts are you need to assert your custodial rights immediately because if, and I've uh, said this, I don't know how many times. If you're in a marriage or a relationship with mom and she leaves and goes to another jurisdiction, let's say she moves to Nevada, to Las Vegas or wherever, and uh, you don't assert your custody rights in a formal way by filing a custody petition, six within six months, if she's somewhere six months, she establishes uh, a domicile there now you're litigating custody of your child a thousand miles away or 2000 miles away. You need to assert your rights aggressively now, right now. And because she can't file a custody petition in another jurisdiction because part of her petition will say it's not in any other jurisdiction. So if she's going to abscond or she's going to leave with someone else or by herself or move in near her parents, 
10 miles away outside of your county or out of your state. Don't wait uh, because you're going to find yourself on the wrong side of a custody petition and you're going to have to litigate it maybe in a place far away where uh, they might not uh, be on your side so, so easily. But don't wait and don't wait years either. Uh, you know, if you want that child in your life and you want to be a good dad and be part of their life, don't let someone leave with your child. Uh, you can negotiate uh, a child custody order, but you still have to file a petition and ask the judge to sign it. So you have an enforcement mechanism in case she takes the kid out of the jurisdiction. You don't want to be with nothing. You don't have an enforcement mechanism to bring the kid back. So you need to assert your rights quickly. Okay. And we're going to make this last question before we wrap up guys. Um, this one is, is it, is it legal marriage? That's the problem. Could you get married in a religious or spiritual ceremony, but not legally binding and before create an agreement that takes care of finances if you split? Well, yeah, you can take care of the uh, assets and finances with a prenup. Um, but it doesn't matter if you don't get, I mean, I'll let you answer this, but I know the answer really is, I mean, if you live in a way that the state views as marriage and it's marriage, it doesn't matter if you had a, a ceremony, right? Right. Uh, so let's say you're in Pennsylvania, there's no common law marriage uh, anymore. It, even if you live together, uh, you know, you have to go through the ceremony. So if you're in a jurisdiction that recognizes uh, marriage through a uh, religious ceremony or a non-official ceremony, yeah, I mean, you could, uh, you, you got to know the local law and where you're domiciled and where where you'd have a prenup and where you'll be living. So it's really very specific. Yeah. Um, do you have any good resources you could recommend guys may want to consider? Do you have a book? Do you have any books that you recommend guys read? Is there a, like a go-to resource that you'd recommend? Because I know there's a lot of questions. There's probably going to be people, people that have questions after this is done rendering. Uh, I don't have a book, although uh, several people have asked me to write one. I just haven't had the time, uh, but I, I, I'll get around to it. I know it's a big undertaking. And I give you a ton of kudos. I know you, you put a lot of time and effort into getting the word out and your, your broadcast. You're writing a book now. Um, but the best thing to do is uh, look at the statutes. Look at, and they're all free. They're online, your state statutes. What are the... How do you determine alimony in your state? How do you determine how equitable distribution, how assets are divided before you get married? Do this uh, prophylactically, like before you need to pick up the phone and call a divorce lawyer. Uh, a lot of guys only know, well, my uncle uh, Harry got divorced and this is, he went, is what he went through. So I guess I'll have to go through. No, no, no. Be smart. Be intentional about what you're getting yourself into, vet your ass off, okay? Make sure that you know to the greatest degree possible about who it is that you're getting into this union with because it's so easy to get married, but it's hard to get unmarried. And mm -hmm. uh, you don't want to do that. That's a good point. And guys also, I mean, the woman you marry is never the same woman that you divorce. Like things change. Yeah, hopefully change. you grow together, but it doesn't always work that way, so... Um, okay, before we wrap up, I just got to quickly shout out to uh, my channel sponsor. You can see it over my shoulder over here, the Tactical Soap Company. You can go to coopersoap.com, use coupon code Cooper at checkout, get 10% off. It's also always pinned in the top link. It's a pheromone infused handmade soap. It's an amazing product and high quality. Uh, it doesn't have any endocrine disruptors that will uh, change your hormone panel. So check that out. Um, also, let's bring uh, John back in here. Um, if you're open to doing another one of these again in the future, maybe a few months down the road on a slightly different topic, I'd love to have you back, man. I think this has been a great broadcast. It seems like My a pleasure. lot of guys got some, got some good value out of this too. So where can people find you if they want to catch up with you? Uh, NobleDivorceLaw.com is my website that has all my contact information. I write my own blog posts. Uh, so uh, I'd be delighted to respond. You could just Google me. I'll, I'll come up and uh, you can see my contact information. Uh, Rich, my pleasure. Be delighted to come back and uh, and have another chat. Absolutely. Okay, so I'm just going to drop your uh, website here in the chat. So it's nobledivorcelaw.com. It's in the chat there if you guys want to pop it open. Uh, Jonathan, thank you for joining me today. I appreciate it. Uh, it's been it's been uh, a blast. Um, well, 
it's not often that I get a legal professional on with me. They're, they're often quite frightened to offer an opinion when it comes to the topics that I talk about. So I want to thank you for doing that. My pleasure. Uh, my pleasure. Anytime. Thanks. All right. All right. We'll catch you guys in the next broadcast. Uh, next before the train wreck is on Monday and follow me on social. If you want to see what the topic is, I'll definitely always announce it a, a couple of days beforehand. We'll see you guys soon. Peace. Thank you.